I'm an architect, and I was trained to build. But I spent almost all my career trying to erase things instead of adding more. And tonight I will tell you a story about rewilding. I grew up in the 70s close to a wild landscape with forests, creeks, mountain areas and lakes. I remember spending most of my young years playing in this landscape. We gave names to all the rivers and our feet knew exactly how to move around on the different trails and pathways. We were truly insiders in these landscapes. And today, all of that is gone. It has been replaced by a new housing project. Now, here's a fact that you might find surprising. The Norwegian wilderness is actually disappearing. 100 years ago, the wilderness in Norway covered half the country. And today, that has been reduced to between 11 and 12 percent. Now, this is in no way unique to Norway. And the loss of nature is one of the major global challenges we face. The wilderness is still only the backdrop for all our development. And until we start making wilderness the main focus for our endeavors, I'm afraid it will still continue to vanish, no matter how careful we are. It's like trying to balance a budget that has no income. No matter how little you spend, at one point, you will have spent it all. And rewilding can provide that income. In the year 2000, I was 25 years old, and I had just graduated from architecture school. Shortly after my graduation, I got a letter from the government telling me to meet up for my mandatory military service. Now, this was also the year the Norwegian parliament set a new brave ambition for the Norwegian armed forces. At this time, the military footprint pretty much covered the entire country. Beefed up during the Cold War era, there were camps, buildings and installations in nearly all the municipalities in Norway. The new ambition was a reorganized military sector, concentrated to fewer locations and made much more efficient. Now, I didn't know it then, but this would turn out to be the challenge that I would spend most of my career working on. Someone figured out that I had a degree in architecture, and I ended up as part of a multidisciplinary think tank working on that one big question. How to make the military footprint smaller? When my service finished, I got my first job, and I ended up as a consultant for the government still working on that big question. And I still am today, 20 years later. To give you an example of that, what that means, I want to take you to a place called Marka. Marka is located on the southwest coast of Norway. Marka was part of the German Artilleriegruppe Wanze, which was part of the Atlantic Ocean Wall. The German forces occupied this area in the 19. 40s and build artillery infrastructure here. After the war, the Norwegian armed forces repossessed the area, making it into a military firing range. Marka is a prime example of the vast nature areas that have been pivotal for the education activities carried out by the military camps. The military call these areas their classrooms. For almost each military camp, there is a nature area that has been used to train the soldiers in all activities from setting up tents and surviving low temperatures to mastering their equipment, including their weapons. In the beginning of the 2000s, I made a study showing that more than 30 different firing ranges, places just like Marka, would be less relevant due to the new organization of the armed forces in Norway. The study was supported and a new problem was born. How do you shut down and abandon an area that has been used to practice war? Now, there are four main issues to deal with when entering a military training area. The landscape may contain installations and built structures, such as trenches, walls, metal and concrete structures, fences, etc., that may be dangerous for people and wildlife. The landscape may be worn and eroded 
due to operations with heavy vehicle traffic. The landscape may be polluted from live practice with ammunition containing heavy metals and chemicals. And the landscape may hide unexploded ordnance and thus pose a risk for any kind of intervention. Now, the first two issues are visible ones and can be easily mapped. The last two, on the other hand, are in most cases invisible, and that requires a different approach to unveil. In order to answer the question of how to abandon a former military training area, it's vital to know its history. Now, most of the military training areas are very large. The biggest ones are more than 100 square kilometers. Just to give you an idea of that size, it's about the same as 13,000 football fields, or 30 times Central Park in New York. It's not possible to start in one corner and investigate all the way through in that kind of area. We need to pinpoint the hotspots and smaller areas that may have problems. And the only way to do this is through engaging in a sort of conversation with the landscape. We need to get to know it, know all its history, identify visible traces, telltale signs, and reconstruct the lifeline of the landscape. In the case of Marga, we conducted several surveys, both with local people who knew parts of the area's history and with military experts who could help us interpret the signs and traces that we saw in the field. We analyzed historical aerial photographs and conducted interviews with different people that had any form of relation to the landscape. They would tell us stories, stories that we could try to find traces of in the field. Now, Marka had a long history embedded in it, also before the war. There were numerous grave heaps in the area, some dating back to the Viking and Bronze area. The area also has unique natural qualities, like rocky beaches and heather fields. The installations left behind by the Germans are also an important part of history and define as valuable storytelling remains from the war. It's not easy to know what the correct state of restoration such an area should undergo. Which traces should be kept and which should be erased? It's a fine balance, and removing one problem might easily create a new one. After we finished our analysis of Marka in 2011, the area has been cleared of explosives. Polluted soil has been carefully removed. Some areas were so dangerous to dig in that the work had to be done using full-scale remote-operated excavators. Some of the areas have been cleared by specially trained dogs that can identify even the smallest traces of explosives. Some areas have been cleared using advanced detection instruments. The beach areas were cleared by specially trained military divers. The many installations from the war have been carefully documented, and dangerous parts of them have been removed or sealed off. And today, the original owners of the land have gotten their properties back. They have applied for permission to start growing crops and gotten the green light from the local authorities to do so. The efforts over the last 20 years have made it possible for a whole new set of activities to unfold in Marka. It has made a journey from a highly dangerous landscape to a safe and productive one. So, what does this story tell us in the big picture? Well, these things take time. Marka was one of the 30 areas that we identified as candidates for being shut down in the early 2000s. And today, the process is completed. It has taken 20 years and it will take even longer to get the nature fully back in shape in that area. The government has now finished clearing almost all the 30 areas we identified through our work in the early 2000s. And this means that a big piece of Norwegian landscape has been reinstalled as clean and safe for people to use. However, in the same period, even bigger pieces of nature has been built down and destroyed by urban development and infrastructure. My experience from working with the military training areas gives me hope because it shows that we are capable of transforming even highly damaged military landscapes back to healthy state again. 
if we can heal these extreme cases, then imagine what other built areas we can bring back to a natural state. I'm sure that there are many other parts of our built environment that today or in the future no longer will serve a purpose. These areas can be transformed through rewilding. Just think of the parking lots and roads. Do you think we will think of them as relevant as we do today in 10 years or 20 years? Don't get me wrong, we are doing a lot of progress. We are getting better at making efficient new built environments in ways that reduce the need to wipe out large nature areas. We are also getting better at building in ways that reduce the need of transport. But our focus is still primarily on the new pieces that we build. Every time we make progress, we also leave something behind. Something that perhaps is not working anymore, that can be changed. The experience from the work with the military training areas also shows the complexity of rewilding. These are big projects involving lots of people and large budgets. All of the buildings and infrastructure that we are making today have ambitious project managers and decision makers, carefully defining the goal of the projects, defining the tasks that the finished project should be able to perform. They are considering how the projects will interact with all the other projects to enable bigger systems, such as cities, regions, or even countries. Imagine if nature had project managers with a similar mandate. The project managers of nature would suggest new projects of wilderness to be erected. They would make sure that the new nature areas were carefully defined to have specific purposes and designed for just those purposes. They would consider how the different projects would interact and form vast natural systems, expanding through cities, regions and even countries. Now, I don't think it's enough just to be careful not to destroy more nature than strictly necessary as we keep on building our new things. We need to start building nature at a similar rate as we build other things. We need to fund these projects and hire skilled people to carry them out. But first, we need to start thinking about nature not only as something we must preserve, but as something we can make make more of, much, much more of. Thank you.